Well, praise the Lord. Thank you. <laughs> Don't tell Ryan. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. Uh, just joking. Thank you so much. I want to thank you, uh, by the way, for all the prayers. Uh, I was hit with some health issues here shortly after I retired, and I'm doing much better now. Thank you for the prayers. And, but I've also been staying quite busy uh, with our section as a presbyter. I've been going up, up moving around the state. I'll be gone again this coming Sunday, helping the church up north in Wilmington. And so we are staying busy. That's one reason why I've been absent some. And, of course, behind the scenes, my wife and I are very busy for the church. And uh, we are working for the Lord for the church behind the scenes. We, you, may not, you may not see me every service here, but I'll tell you, we're, we're busy for the Lord. We're counseling. We're praying with people. We're contacting people. We're reaching out to people. We're, we're staying busy for the kingdom, just so you know that. I, don't, I want you to be aware of that. So, but thank you. Thank you for the very, 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 very warm welcome. Well, now, it was an interesting subject matter the Lord laid on my heart. And I, I wasn't altogether um, exactly the way I wanted to word the subtitle. It's on your outline. It says, first things first is our theme. And by the way, when I told Pastor Ryan that I was going to be talking about first things first, he couldn't believe it. He says, well, Dad, that's the name of our series that we're starting. I says, well, that's good. We, he, I got that from the Lord. And he got that from the Lord. And the two met together. We were talking. And he said, that's exactly what we're calling the series. I said, well, that works out perfectly. But what I wanted to say on the subtitle in your outline, it says, are you saved? Then be. Here's what I really wanted to ask. Are you sure you're saved? Are you sure you're saved? And we're going to talk about that today, what that looks like, and, and, and why we're asking the question that way. I just want to clear up any confusion or straighten up any preconceived idea as to what a Christian really is. There's a lot of different definitions out there on this subject. And again, it wasn't easy to come before a great congregation like this with so many people that love the Lord in this church. You're just an awesome church. Believe me, I go up and down the state. You are an awesome church. God's doing awesome things. But here's my contention. that when it comes to God and when it comes to Christianity, we cannot prove and have proof and confirmation without knowledge. And we cannot have knowledge of God without knowing God. And that key word there today is the word knowing. And you cannot know him, tr truly, truly know him without experiencing him. I can know all there is about something. You, you, you can put a beamer in front of me, a, a, a Mercedes Benz in front of me. You can put any kind of really neat car in front of me, and I could know a lot about it, read a lot about it, but I could, I could never tell you what it's like unless I drive it. I can only tell you what I know, but I could never tell you from experience what it's, what I, if what I know is everything they claim they are unless I drive it. It's got to be more than head knowledge. It's got to be more than just information that we have about God. Because you can only know that knowledge works when we practice that knowledge. When we practice that knowledge. And, and let me give you some scripture to help bear this out. The first one here is in 2 Peter chapter 3, chapter 1, excuse me, verses 3 and 4. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. And, through the, and by the way, that's a statement through the knowledge of him. We've been talking about that. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may what? Participate. Please underscore that word. Participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Now, once again, today, being in Christ is great. It is great. 
But it is not enough participation than just to know about God. You have to experience God by participating in the divine nature, by participating in his word, by participating in his presence, by participating in prayer, by participating in this moment of intimacy, being with the Lord and talking with the Lord and letting the Lord talk with us, being in meditation and meditating in the Lord. The, uh, the psalmist in Psalm 1 said, I meditate in his laws day and night. That, that's all the part of participating. It, it's wonderful to, to, it's wonderful to be in Christ. It's wonderful to be a Christian. It's wonderful to be here today. But it isn't enough. Amen. There must be a participation into his nature. Another passage of scriptures in 2 Peter chapter 2. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, then they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Now, be, be, before we go any further on, uh, on the scripture, I want you to note something here. The word knowing here is referring to, in the Greek, what is called an experiential knowledge. The idea with the word know is experiential knowledge. So if they've escaped the world by the experiential knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning, it would have been better for them not to have experiential knowledge, the way of righteousness, and to have experiential knowledge, it, and then turn their backs on it. The whole point here is it wasn't the fact that these were unbelievers who knew more about God, but then they turned their backs on him. That's what some, that's what some uh, people believe this means. Some people believe this means that, well, they just found out more information about God, but they still chose to stay where they were. No, because it says at the end of the verse that the, the dog returns to his vomit and the swine re returns back to the mud. No, they had come from the mud. They had come from the vomit. Excuse the expression. They had come from the world. They had been set free. They had known the Lord. They experienced God. But now they've gone back on that. It would have been better for them not to even experience God than to experience him and then gone back on him. Again, the word know here is referring to an experiential knowledge. It means they knew more than just heard about him. They knew more than just some information. They knew more than just had a knowledge of God. They, they, they knew more than be able to define and explain to you the attributes and the characteristics and the ways of God. They, they knew him personally. They had accepted him personally. They knew him, but they chose to go back. In fact, you read the whole second chapter of Peter here, of the, uh, the previous verses, it talks about how they left the way. They left what the one verse says, and they left the straight way. They were on the straight way. They were on the right path, but they left that straight path. So I'm going to ask you a question here. What do the following have in common? First of all, Jesus said, come to me all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Remain in me, and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain one translation says, unless you are ceaseless in me, you're ceaseless in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you are ceaseless, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Reading on, Colossians. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. If, say if, yes. if, you've heard me say this before over the years, 
The Greek word for the word if here means contingent upon. In other words, these things will be, these things will happen if contingent upon you continue in your faith. Established and firm and do not move from the hope. Do not walk away from the straight way. Do not depart from the straight path held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and have and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now, it's so clear here that what Paul's saying is the word if here is a big contingency. All of this promise will come true. Everything will be as it will be and will be as it should be as long as we continue. As long as we continue. Continue in our faith. I'm simply saying... Coming to church on Sunday morning isn't enough. It's wonderful. Jesus went to the temple as was his custom. The Bible says, and on the Sabbath, Jesus went to the temple as was his custom. It was his custom. Jesus went to church on Sunday. Whatever their Sabbath was, he was in church. Jesus was in church. He believed in it. But it's got to be more than just showing up to church on Sunday. Matthew 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us approach God's throne. And then one more, and we just didn't have time to read the 50 others we could have read. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash you hand, your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. By the way, when James wrote this, he was writing to the churches. In, in fact, when James wrote the book, he was referring to, you know, like Colossians was the church to Colossae. Philippians was the church to Philippians. When he wrote the book, the church, the book of Ephesians, he's writing to the church of Ephesus. But when he, James wrote the book, he was writing it, according to scholars, to all the churches of that day and apply for today. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. So these all have in common one thing. Now, there's wonderful applications. There's wonderful teachings in all these verses. But one thing they do all have in common. They are an invitation to know Christ better. It, it's an invitation. And this is where and how we experience him. Uh, you have, I have, to come before him in his presence. It, it's wonderful. It's wonderful that we showed up to church today. But it isn't going to be enough. This, what we just read, is what we mean by participating in his divine nature. That Peter talked about. This is part of, today, you, when we sat here worshiping, I was back there, we worshiping together, we were participating in his divine nature. But it isn't going to be enough on just Sunday. It's got to become a 24-7 experience. I believe that Christianity is in crisis today. I really do. And I want to ask a question here that uh, of these three people in the Bible, what did these three people have in common? Let me take a moment. We're not going to read these passages of Scripture. That would be a good devotional for you to do this coming week. Take time to read these storylines. But in the Ethiopian eunuch, let me quote some things for you. First of all, it said, and I quote from Acts 8, had to go to Jerusalem to worship. The eunuch, Ethiopian, you had to go to Jerusalem to worship. It says it in Acts 8. And this story, it also said, on the way home, reading the book of Isaiah. In other words, I took that phrase right out of the scripture. On the way back home from worship, the Ethiopian eunuch was reading scripture. Now, God supernaturally brought Philip alongside of him. In a sense, he had his ability. He was running, keeping up with a chariot. He was running. He says, do you understand what you're reading? Right out of the scripture. Do you understand what you're reading? And here's what the Ethiopian eunuch said. How can I, unless someone explains it to me? 
So Ethiopian eunuch has been to worship. He's reading the Bible on the way back home from worship. And here comes Philip alongside the chariot. He jumps in in the chariot with him. Do you understand what you're reading? How can I let someone explain it to me? We go to Lydia, the Lady of Purple, in Acts 16, 14. The Bible says she was a worshiper of God. Cornelius and his family. Here it says, four, and I take it right out of the scripture. Four days ago, I was in my house praying. So here's Cornelius praying. And then God said, God has heard your prayer and he remembered your gifts to the poor. Right out of the scripture. Right out of the scripture. So here was Cornelius, a man who was a man of prayer and a man who gave to the poor. So what we have in these three characters combined together is they were worshiping God and or reading scripture, giving to the poor, attending church, and praying. Let me read those again. Worshiping God, reading scripture, giving to the poor, attending church, praying. It sounds pretty Christian to me. That's what Christians do, isn't it? That's what Christians do. But here's what's interesting. Are you ready? Not one of these characters were Christians. Not one of these three people were Christians. They were religious, but not Christian. They were religious, but not Christian. Now, what was one of pastor's favorite phrases he gave you on a regular basis? Ready? Go home and check me out. Go home and read these stories. What you're going to find is, and, and, and two people I was talking to about this both had said to me, I, I, I never knew that. I, ne I, I never picked up on that. I didn't realize that. I mean, when you read that someone gives to the poor and they're praying, when you read that someone going to church and reading scripture, when you read that somebody's been worshiping God, uh, you, you have the, and when you read that somebody's praying, you have the impression they are what? Not one was a Christian. They were religious, but they weren't Christian. And here's, here's a delusion. We are, our, our Christianity is in crisis. There's this understanding today, and I, I feel like the word Christian has been so diluted, it has been so ripped apart and so torn down and so misused and so abused and so misunderstood and, and, got, and that some way, somehow, we think that because I was raised in a Christian home or I was raised in a home where my parents went to church, that that automatically somehow qualifies me as Christian. I was even talking to a man one time who thought that when he was born, he was born a Christian. I said, no, that's impossible. We were born sinners. We have to become a Christian. There's this, again, this understanding that we can almost kind of do as we please and still be Christian. You, when, when you read statistics out there that claim that so many percentage of people are Christians, I, I think I read one time where six, and again, things change in statistics. Please understand. Okay, you don't base your life on statistics necessarily, life of the church on statistics necessarily. But something like 68% of people claim to be Christian in America. Honey, if 68% of the people in America were Christian, we wouldn't have the country in the mess it's in. Amen. You might have 68% are religious, but you don't have 68% that are Christian. You know what Dr. Billy Graham once said? He said, if everybody who had come to the altar in my crusades over the years were still a Christian, we would be a Christian nation today. That's what Dr. Billy Graham said before he died. Now, that was years before he died. He actually said, if we would have everybody still serving the Lord, Dr. Billy Graham, out of his own mouth, I read it. That if everybody was still serving the Lord that had come to all, that had come to my crusades, over the years in America, America would be so Christian today because of the influence of Christianity. 
So we have a lot of religious people going to church in America today. Tens of thousands of people are going to church today who have the understanding and the belief and, the, and the, they think that they are Christian. They think because they're going to church and they may give to the poor. They may give an offering. They may praise the Lord. They may read their Bibles. They may sing and pray. And all, they may go through the ritual of all these things and somehow think that that makes them Christian. That does not make us Christian any more than the eunuch or Lydia or Cagnus was a Christian. Prayer, worship, giving, reading scriptures, but didn't know Jesus as their personal savior. That's a delusion. Now I'm gonna ask you the question today, are you sure you're saved? We cannot be saved unless we accept Jesus. A very horrific thing happened this week. It was horrific. It was, it was just horrific. It was heavy heart. I prayed. I prayed. I heard about that plane crash. 170 some people. I'm not talking anything about the, how it happened. Can I tell you what the greatest tragedy of that plane crash was? Are you ready? Do you want to know what the greatest tragedy of that plane crash was? You ready? Okay, I won't tell you then if you're not going to tell me. <laughs> no, just, just kidding, just kidding. Here's the greatest tragedy of that plane crash. Did they know Jesus before they died? The plane crash is tragic. It's horrific, but more horrific did they pass out of this life without knowing Jesus as their personal Savior? You know, there was that, there, there was that uh, Eddie Amin. Remember Eddie Amin? How many of you remember Eddie Amin? You, you older folks are going to remember that. I'm looking for the gray hair convention right now. <laughs> all, right, I, all right, I see us out there. Okay. And you mean was a man that if you didn't agree with him, you were considered Christian and you were tortured in his torture chamber. I read up on this. I read up on this and followed it. And, uh, but if, so if you didn't agree with him and his regime, you were automatically classified as a Christian. So again, like I said, while he tortured these people, now watch this. So let's say he tortured this many people, and this was hundreds of people, hundreds, maybe thousands of people. Maybe this many were saved. But there were maybe this many who weren't saved, but he called them Christian. How tragic it is that you were put in his torture chamber and died that way, but you still wouldn't go to heaven because if you didn't know Jesus, you can't get to heaven. It's a horrific tragedy of what happened this week with that plane crash, but the greater tragedy is were they ready to meet Jesus. Jesus said, and folks, I want to define Christianity. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You cannot be saved unless you accept Jesus Christ into your heart by confessing your sins and inviting him to come in. We cannot be saved just because I was raised in a home where my dad was a painter didn't make me a painter automatically. I had to learn how to paint. If you were raised in a home and your dad or her mother was a professional in some field, that didn't make you a professional in that field. You had to learn the trade. Just because you were raised in a Christian home doesn't make us Christian unless I come to that place in my life where I accept Jesus in my heart to become a Christian. We have to tell young men and women that are getting their credentials. In fact, my wife and I, we leave tomorrow for a meeting up in Pennsylvania. And we interview these candidates for, to become ministers. And we have to make sure they got a call. Because you can't assume you have a call to ministry because your mom and dad are in the ministry. Doesn't assume that you, therefore, have a call to ministry. Have you heard from God for yourself that you have a call? I am the way, the truth, the life. No one can, 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 can come to me, can know me, except through me to go to the Father. You have to accept me. 
We have a gentleman in our church today. I don't know if he's in this service. He'll be in the next service. But he was hanging out with Pastor John the last day, 2019. He's the last recorded soul that got saved in our church. Aww. Jared was a, is a young man and his wife. He was raised Mormon. So he was raised in the Mormon church. Been in our church for about a year. Ben was at the retreat, setting our services for about a year. And, and Pastor John asked the question, where well, are you saved? And he said he didn't even know what John was talking about. Raised in a church home. Raised in a religious home. Didn't know what it meant. But on December 31st, he found out what it meant and accepted Jesus Christ as a Savior. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Are you sure you're saved? Have you ever taken time to invite Jesus into your heart to confess your sins and confess that he is Lord and ask him to forgive you of your sins and receive him? If you've not done that, you will get a chance to end in the service. But I want to go to part two, and it's short. It will be done. Are you saved, dash, then be? <laughs> In Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 40, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening. Say listening, listening. to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Listen to those words. Only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. So let's answer the question, what was Mary doing? It's a fill-in for you. She was taking time to know Jesus. Now, we need to answer something here. Was Mary, was, was Martha doing wrong to prepare for Jesus to come? Yes or no? No. You got a guest coming. You got Jesus, the Son of God's coming. You want to make things right. You want things to be ready. You want things to be normal. It wasn't that Mar Martha was doing something wrong. Now listen carefully. But at this point in time, at this moment in history, what was needed more than Martha worrying about being ready for Jesus to come was that Martha do what Mary was doing and do the better thing and stop what you are doing and just sit and listen in my presence. That is so beautiful. And, I, and I'll, I'll prove it because you remember when Jesus sent a couple of disciples ahead of them to get the upper room ready? You know, you know get the table set and all that. So Jesus believed in preparation. He, he believed it was okay to, to take time to get ready. He, there's scripture to back that up. So Jesus wasn't anti what Martha was doing. But at this given time, at this given moment in history, it was important of what Mary was doing. And, and she was setting a great example for Martha to follow. And folks, let me just say something to you. We are at a point and time in history. Believe me. If we're following the news, if we're following what's going on in the Middle East, we are at a point in time in history. This is a good time to sit still in the presence of God and listen to him. Amen. Listen to him. Listen to his word. Follow his word. Prepare ourselves. Let, let's set aside all that busy stuff. All the, it's not that some of those things are wrong. It's not that they're wrong. But there comes a time when we just need to stop everything. 
Folks, we need to stop everything and just sit in his presence and listen, listen, absorb him, get in his presence, his intimacy with him. 2020, it's time for 2020 vision, spiritual vision. <laughs> where we can take time to be in his presence every day of our lives. We need to take time with God. Make time with God. How, how else can we bring calm and understanding to our spirit unless we're in his presence to understand him and know him better? I want to close with a very strong and very powerful statement by Paul in Philippians 3.8. It'll be a little lengthy because it's from the Amplified but it's powerful. Yes, furthermore, I count everything as loss. But just listen carefully to this. I count everything as loss compared to the possession of the priceless privilege, the overwhelming preciousness, the surpassing worth and supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus. And so... And supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, and, and of progressively becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, of perceiving and recognizing and understanding him more fully and clearly. For his sake, I have lost, I have lost everything and consider it to be mere rubbish. Can you believe this? Refuge, dregs, in order that I may win and gain Christ, the point and the anointed one. In other words, Paul was saying, I would, in essence, in today's vernacular, I, I, I want to give up everything. As, everything is as, as rubbish compared to the difference of knowing who he is. In other words, there could be nothing greater, Paul was saying, in all of his life. Nothing greater. Everything is considered as rubbish, as refuge, compared to knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, it's not enough to be here on Sunday. This is a great thing to do. This is a great place to be on Sunday. But it is not enough. That's right. There may be many things you will feel as important in this new year, and they may be. But first things first. First things first. Make sure you are saved. Then be in his presence on a regular basis. Stop the stuff. Stop the business and make sure you're taking time in this new year. Make sure you're taking time to be in the presence of God. Listen, I want to report to you as your past, pre previous pastor and his wife. We spend a lot of time in the Bible and in prayer. And I'll answer the question that I'm asking every time somebody are you enjoying retirement? We miss the daylights out of you. But we are enjoying our retirement. We are enjoying our retirement. All right? We miss you terribly. But we are enjoying our retirement. And we're spending time, we're spending so much time with God. We really are. We'll talk about the Bible. She'll share what she's learning. I'll share what I'm learning. And I'll, I'll run things by her. And she really, we're just having a ball with the Bible. Folks. Take time, because Jesus is coming soon, so you are ready. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Father in heaven, we just thank you for your word. We're going to continue to trust you, to lead us, to guide us, to direct us, Lord, where you would have us to go and have us to be. And right now, if we ask folks, if I believe we're going to have a screen up there, are we not? Do we have the salvation prayer? Here's the prayer that I want to make sure that you pray today before you leave. Now, here's what I want to you to think about. We don't want you to, if you know that you've prayed this prayer and you know that you're a Christian, you know that you're serving God, and you know you're not perfect, I'm not perfect, none of us are perfect, but we're striving to serve God, to know God. But if you know for sure that you know for sure you are saved, then you don't need to pray this prayer. But you can help pray for anybody in this room. We're not gonna track you down, we're not gonna chase you down. But you need to make sure. Now, if you are getting saved for the first time, you should pull up one of those slips at the back of the pew and write that information out or put it on your slip. Let us know that you prayed. 
you, if you thought you were a Christian and you never prayed this prayer and really accepted this prayer as part of what you know you need to do to be saved, then I encourage you to read this and I encourage you to pray this prayer right now. I encourage you to do that as it's up there right now. I, I, I've had two funerals since I, you know, two weeks ago, I had two funerals, a Monday and a Tuesday. And, uh, and I was speaking at a church up in Middletown and I, I heard, you can hear people praying, except in Jesus. You can hear people praying, whispering. I always offer the plan of salvation. And in the particular service was up at Middletown, the Assembly God Church up there. I heard, uh, I heard a person praying the prayer while I was praying it. They were busy for the Lord. They were a worker in the church. They hadn't prayed, apparently. But they did that Sunday. If you don't know for sure if you're saved, you need to know before you leave today that you are ready should Jesus come. Amen. Amen. Now, Father, again, if there are those who are praying this prayer, let them believe what they are praying. Let them understand this is going to happen to them. That as they confess their sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us. And so I pray, God, that you will just continue to change lives for the, your honor and glory and kingdom. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. We're going to leave that prayer up there. Don't rush, but pray this prayer. And you should let somebody know, though, that you have taken this step forward. God bless you, and thank you for the privilege today. We love you.